I started with my master's degree in educational technology from Boise State, and it was just, I wasn't ready to get a master's in social studies content, and it seemed like a good thing to do. We were looking as a district at moving more towards one-to-one -one devices, and I kind of just thought to myself, it would be nice to know more about how this works. And so that was really where I got my, my master's and really sort of had this intro to using technology for more than just showing students information and your, your traditional PowerPoint and here's my notes and here's the visual. And started looking at all of the different things that you can do, the, the different media that you can use to share information with students and on the flip side of that, have them demonstrate their understanding and their knowledge. And the, the idea that communication does not always have to be, um, to have to be written, is really kind of a big driving, driving force of that for me. So I have a master's in ed tech. I also have an online K-12 teaching certificate and being able to blend those two things together because I had no desire to leave the classroom. I like being able to interact on an almost daily basis with my students in face-to-face -face settings, but having that option of blending things and as we have students who need more creative scheduling options, and as we are moving more towards having common instructional practices across our world studies teachers in our building, this made a lot of sense to me. And we were able to kind of start dividing up who is creating what pieces of content that we can then use to share them commonly with all of our students, regardless of who's teaching. I went through kind of a stretch in, in teaching a couple of years ago where the flu and H1N1 was just so prevalent. And I had all of these students who were out with legitimate medical issues and couldn't come to school. And it was rather than me needing to send an email to each kid individually, this is what we did. My first intro to this was, oh my gosh, I'm going to, and this was before we had Moodle, before we had anything else in our district. I'm going to create myself a course web page that I can put, this is our unit stuff. If you are behind, this way you don't have to be in the room to get the reading calendar for the week. If you are ahead, this is where it's at. And I looked at that and I said, that's a, it's really simplistic um, and it's not very robust, but it kind of started with this idea that kids need to be able to adjust the pace for a variety of reasons. And sometimes that means they need to be in, ahead and other times the same kids are going to be working behind and just I looked at this idea of being able to blend and then flip elements of my classroom and I said this meets that need. The kids who need to hear the information again or who were gone and need those notes I can put those directions or I can put that lecture or I can put that you know video clip or whatever into a place where they can access it and then if we move things like discussion online into an online setting then that frees up some of our time for more of the skill driven work we're trying to do social studies went through in the state of iowa a standards shift a couple of years ago this is i think year two with our new standards and world history standards in particular are very skill driven the idea of being able to to do more of that skill work in the classroom with me as kind of the the skill quote unquote expert that was really valuable to me and it freed up some of our, our classroom educational minutes for this is the stuff you need help with. You don't need help getting the notes. You don't need help necessarily with content acquisition. You need help with what are you doing with that? And then as a nice side effect, that actually freed up time for kids who did need help getting the content. I had somehow a few more minutes where I could then, let me teach this to you in a different way. Let me use a different example to, to illustrate this to you. Why don't you talk with this other student who's kind of experiencing some of the same things and see if your understanding is the same as theirs, and if not, we'll do it again. So it allowed me to differentiate in a much more kind of just-in-time format than the traditional, you get the information from me, and then you have to go do the skill practice on your own, and then we come back together and I give you feedback, and then you go and you fix it on your own. So this allowed me to be a lot more responsive to what the student needs were in my room on a much faster basis. Initially, you know, I, I kind of had gone to um, some of the people in leadership in our building, and as we were opening up this opportunity for 
um, some of these blended classes. I actually was in, I think it was the, the second cohort that kind of went through at Johnston. And we'd kind of had a handful of people express interest and admin did some selecting based upon you know, kind of our ILT set up in the building and just who kind of would have release time to do some of these things and then maybe to offer some of these, these early courses. And I said, you know, I, I have a lot of background in this. And what does that look like? And was in, you know, I, I had the ability to kind of start halfway through the cohort if I wanted to. And I looked at what some of the requirements were and what some of the topics that were going to be covered um, within that blended flip cohort. And I said, you know what, I'm just I'm gonna do the whole thing. It's not gonna hurt me to have a brush up and some additional background information. And it actually ended up being really valuable because I remember sitting in some of those first um, face-to-face meetings for um, the very first class in the cohort and thinking, oh my gosh, I hadn't thought about how easy it is to take some of these lower end depth of knowledge activities and with one tweak, significantly raise the, you know, the depth of knowledge um, that I'm asking students to do. It doesn't have to be, I have to completely reinvent the wheel. It's, this is what I currently do. How can I change that just a little bit? And so doing, I think, a lot of those activities in that first class, even though it maybe wasn't something I needed from a technology standpoint, just having the reminder from an instructional standpoint, I thought was really valuable and really has benefited the students that I've worked with as I've continued to develop things for my own classes here at Johnston. I teach two classes at Johnston. I teach a general education world history class, and then I teach an AP US history class. And depending upon which class you're in, the way it is blended or flipped is very different. In AP, I'm able to give students a lot more independence and freedom because they do have some of those content acquisition skills to be able to say, okay, you know, here were three topics we didn't get to cover or we don't need as much in depth or you may want to come back to them. They are complex. Um, anytime you were talking about economics in history, students struggle. And so being able to put a, a no more than 10 to 15 minute clip on our, our course page of this is what that is again, has been really valuable. I am able to um, offload some of that in-class discussion. A lot of our, our course is centered around historical thinking skills, which College Board has said we need to demonstrate through writing. I have 40 plus kids. They don't want to write on a daily basis. I don't want to read it on a daily basis. And I had actually come up with a pretty effective discussion strategy, but we were having really good discussions that kids wanted to be able to go back to. And so what I started doing was taking some of those topics, we might do one of three questions in class, and the other two, it was, you're going to do these online sometime before X date, so that we can refer back to them and pull out information as we need it in, in additional class activities. So I'm not able to completely blend and flip that one just because of the pace, but there are activities or there are days where I can give them a heads up and say, hey, this day, you're gonna check in with me and you're gonna go do the work. So that's been really nice to be able to give them that freedom. In World Studies, it's a sophomore level course. It's covering some abstract concepts. And so what I've used with that one, it's more, you might need to hear this again, or you were gone. So here's the video clip with this. And we're able then to build in some note-taking strategies. We've, we've done a couple of, how should you watch these, you know, these course videos? And how should you be pulling information out? It's not just you sit it, you watch it, you're done. It's what should you kind of be expected to do. And I've actually found that's really improved my teaching practice. I have to be a lot more deliberate. If I'm putting the purpose statement in front of them and I only have you know, a set number of minutes, I have to make sure that I am concise and that I am articulate and that I am getting to that point as opposed to sometimes what happens in class discussion where somebody asks a question, you go off on a tangent that's not necessarily bad, but is, is it the best way of using your educational minute? We're always focused on time and time is, is a precious commodity that we don't get more of. How do you maximize it? And so what I've been able to teach my students to do is you watch it and then you are able to pause it and replay it and do some deeper thinking with things. And then I'll have them bring questions back in with them. And like I said earlier, it's able to free up some of those minutes for more directed skill practice. You have done this content acquisition piece on your own. What questions do we need to address? And that now maybe takes 10 minutes instead of 25. 
which is going to give us then more time for, you know, this group of kids really got it. Why don't you go and then check in with me before you leave? And this group of kids, you need a little bit more support, but you don't need a lot from me. You need about a five minute check-in and you're good. And then you know, you've got your group kind of at the end where it's you, you need some additional help. Let me figure out what that looks like. So I've really been able to differentiate and scaffold a lot easier within my classroom just because of how I'm structuring some things. Because we're doing abstract, abstract concepts, um, things like enlightenment and absolutism, those are things kids struggle with. So it doesn't always work in a perfect setup to move all of that content acquisition out of the classroom. There are still pieces with those units, but as we've moved further into history and we're getting closer to present day, there is a lot more where I can tell them, you know, here's the video with this information. You need to go find you know, your own video or your own news article or your own artifact that fits with this topic. And we're able to do a little bit different learning and structure our, our classroom minutes a little bit differently. It's not quite that station rotation, but it's really trying to get at the heart of using our data to drive the education. And I've just found that being able to use the technology and being able to blend and then flip elements of my classroom has really freed up. Again, it's freed up those minutes. I'm not needing to meet with every kid and figure out where are you at. It's we've, we're able to pull in the data and we're able to pull in the technology and blend the two together and get us to a point where kids can get what they need in the classroom, which has been so, so valuable. It's really funny. There are times where I will do, you know, notes or we'll give directions or something in the class and I'll have kids who are like, wait, I need to pause and rewind that. Can you, can you, can you go back for me? And kids are like, you should have been paying attention. They're like, no, but in the videos we get to pause her and we get to rewind her and I get to listen to it again. I need it again. Um, so that's just kind of one of those interesting things where the, I can kind of see them being like, I, I don't want to ask you to repeat that, but I'm so used to having the ability to go back. So this just, I, I don't know if it's been a benefit. It's kind of a funny anecdote where I've had kids tell me, can we rewind you just a little bit? <laughs> Will you say what page number again? What, what, what question is this going with on our study guide? I'm confused. Purpose statement one more time. There are certainly challenges anytime you are incorporating um, technology and you're doing something new, but I've always approached it from a standpoint of it's not everything all at once. And again, it's not, you're not teaching an online course when you, when you blend and flip things. There are still things that are better done face-to-face. -face. There have been times where I have tried something blended or flipped and it didn't work. We needed to kind of backtrack a little bit and reteaching needed to happen. But I would say that those instances have been few and far between. Because of some of the stuff that we're doing within those blended and flipped classes, from, from a student standpoint, as I'm taking those blended and flipped cohort classes, we're doing some of that, that outlining and that planning. And those mistakes within the classroom then are fewer and further between usually it's because I have some element of a video that didn't load right or a, a link that was broken within something else. So those don't feel like they're quite as hard to overcome. They don't feel quite as intimidating and it's not, um, it shouldn't make anybody freeze up just to potentially have a little bit of technology glitch as they're getting into it. One thing I've kind of looked at, at doing, we're looking at switching how we teach world history in Johnston next year. And so right now we start with exploration and go through current events. We're looking at starting with a current event boot camp set up next fall and then moving backwards. And so as we start the year with some of those topics that kids have more background with, the idea is that we potentially can pull in outside resources that we maybe don't have to create. Maybe a kid really already understands the causes of the Cold War and wants the in-depth college lecture from the Gilder Lerman site that's got, you know, a a deep dive on one of them. And we can still have them do that and meet the requirements for the standards that we as a content team have selected. So I see benefits to being able to do that as we continue to kind of adjust our course a little bit. I've got all of these ideas for how I want to see that, that used to meet the needs of the kids who already get it. Um, I think it's so easy sometimes to differentiate for the students who don't get it it's let me find a different example. It's let me share this with you again and then walk you through separate pieces. I think as teachers, we have more of those types of things to go to in our teaching arsenal than we do at the other end of you already get this and I don't know how to 
construct a lesson that meets your needs and everybody else's needs. So having some type of blended and flipped classroom environment, I really see a benefit of, even if it's not resources I have created, of being able to pull in resources from other places and have a place to put them and have them organized for students and have them be able to, you know, have identified check-in points, but then it's, it kind of almost becomes a little bit more of an independent study setup. And you as the instructor for those students are more of the facilitator than the keeper of that information. So I really see some, some benefits to, to being able to use the things that I've learned throughout these, these classes in the cohort to really more fully meet both ends of the spectrum. One of the things we have, we've been wanting to offer for the last couple of years is a blended flipped world history. We have a US history class that Tom Griffin has blended and flipped and that's very successful. We continue to kind of see growth and movement with that course. I think not having the, the freshmen in our high school, they are still at the eight, nine middle school building. They don't understand what flipped and blended is. And so I have some interest every year, but it's not quite been enough yet to offer the class. So I'm really hoping within the next year or so, I can kind of pull myself together a little bit more and have some specific things I can share with students who are freshmen coming in as sophomores saying, this is what you can expect to see. It is not independent study. It is not, you know, you will check in with me one day and then I don't see you for three weeks, but truly how that can be beneficial. I think the selling point for that is more and more as we have additional technology offerings within the workplace, more and more people are doing telecommuting and more and more people are having days where they are doing you know, just what we're doing here. And it's a digital team meeting. And you then kind of have your things that you need to do in order to be a contributing member of the team and a set deadline for them. And then you come back. I'm a big proponent. Not everybody loves history. Not everybody loves world history. Sometimes it's a hard sell for kids, but I really try and get them to see these are skills that regardless of whether you are going to a four-year institution, you are going to a trade school, or you are going straight into the workforce, these are giving you valuable communication skills in an ever-changing market that can be so beneficial. How marketable are you if you can say to your employer, I already have experience doing work from you know, a digital setup and, and telecommuting and being a contributing member of a team. If you can say as somebody who is 18 or 19 years old when you graduate from high school, I can do that. How much ahead are you from other people who don't have that skill? Don't try and do everything at once. <laughs> it's really interesting. My husband is currently going through the cohort and he teaches AP psychology in the building. And he's looking at me going, how are you not overwhelmed? Like, how do you pick one thing to focus on? And I said, you have to pick, a, you've got to pick a unit for the future. And then all of those ideas that you've got for how you want to do it for the unit you're in right now, write them down so that you don't lose them. <laughs> but know that you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to do everything all at once. And I think some people forget, again, it's, it's going back to that idea that it's, it's blended, it's flipped, it's not an online course. You don't have to have everything done all at once. The goal I kind of set for myself is I would like to have one element as I'm kind of continuing to build for each class, for each unit. I wanted to have one element that was blended or flipped, whether that was a lecture piece or an activity piece or a discussion piece or a, a content sharing piece. I wanted to have one thing for each unit. And I've, I've stuck pretty close to that in terms of whether it's creating a video lecture or again, an online discussion piece for students to participate in so that then when you get to the end of the year, you don't feel burnt out. You don't, you don't question your sanity and go, why did I decide that I wanted to try and flip everything all at once? But then you still have some of those ideas of what went well, what didn't. And then as the technology is continuing to, to change, I just, I've got plans to go back to the beginning of each at the beginning of each year and essentially continue blending and flipping one thing per unit. I've got the unit that I created as part of the cohort that I, I kind of use as my model, but I'm still changing and tweaking things with that as I get more into it and, and continue to make progress. I would like to be able to find more ways for students to demonstrate their understanding one of the things that we do in world studies is we have them write these document-based essay questions, these DBQs. Um, it's focused on bigger questions and it's getting to a lot of our argumentative 
skills that the state has said, these are the social studies literacy skills you want them to have, in addition to being able to look at primary and secondary sources and take a position in all of those things. And this is the second or third time we've done them so far this year. And the big skill focus for this one was cause and effect. And we know that kids can do cause and effect, but it's being able to, this one happens to be on the Treaty of Versailles leading to World War II. We have a lot of kids who are going straight to, you know, well, this caused really bad um, conditions in Germany, Hitler was able to rise, and then World War II started. Well, there are some other steps in there. And so again, it's not that they can't do cause and effect, it's that they're not able to see the complete picture. And I had this epiphany about two weeks ago where I just said, the standards don't specify they have to be able to write. Maybe we don't have them write these. Maybe we give them the option. The kids who can write them, great. The kids who need to be able to just do their outline and then tell me, maybe we have some kind of setup where they've got, you know, a certain number of minutes in order to be able to verbally tell us, this is my position, this is the evidence I'm picking, this is the cause and effect, this is my argument, and here's my conclusion, that gets to the same skills. And I feel like that's going to be more attainable the more the more exposure we give them to the appropriate use of technology and not just technology for technology's sake. But I'm looking for ways that we can have students turn around and use technology to demonstrate their own understandings. I feel like personally that's one area that I, I'm not as far along as I would like to be. I feel like it's a lot easier to find things to do on my end as opposed to giving students some of the freedom and the ability to to learn those pieces of technology and then use them to demonstrate their understanding. So that would be where I'm kind of looking to go for next year is continuing to blend and flip elements of my class, but also look for different ways that we can differentiate that assessment piece for students. I think it's very easy as, especially as somebody who's been in the classroom for a while and to kind of think, oh, I know how to lesson plan. I know, I know how to do this. And then to sit back and kind of see some of the planning documents that were used within, I think it's class two, where you actually kind of get into planning out what a unit looks like that I, I kind of had this moment of, oh, yeah, I know how to plan, but planning for a blended setup is a little bit different. And you have to be very purposeful, again, so that you're not burning yourself out trying to do everything, but also so that you can maybe build in more of those check-in points, especially as you are starting to blend and flip with your students. They will need additional checkpoints to make sure that they are essentially being held accountable and are getting what they need out of the things that you're providing for them. I kind of, I think, discounted at least in the beginning how important that document would be. I find myself going back to a modified version of it on paper and pencil every time I get ready to do a new unit. I'm looking, I'm saving those and I'm looking at those and I'm tweaking and changing and adding to them as I'm going through units over and over and over again. And if that's been, that was a piece that I would say as an established teacher, I kind of said, no, I know how to plan a unit. I'm good. I'm glad that I have that document and that kind of background and the supports as I was doing that in the class to now turn around and do it in my own class. This is Angela Kai and my final APUSH presentation is about the Chinese Exclusion Act which falls into time period 6. On May 6, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed by Congress and signed by President Chester A. Arthur. This act provided an absolute 10-year ban on Chinese labor immigration. For the first time, federal law banned entry of an ethnic working group because they claimed it endangered the American way of life. The Chinese Exclusion Act required the few non-laborers who sought entry into the U.S. to obtain certification from the Chinese government that they were qualified to immigrate. This group found it increasingly difficult to prove that they were not laborers because the 1882 Act defined banned Chinese immigrants as skilled and unskilled laborers and Chinese employed in mining. As a result, very few Chinese could enter the country under the 1882 law. The Exclusion Act also placed new requirements on Chinese who had already entered the country. If they left the U.S., they had to obtain certifications to re-enter. Prerequisites for return to the U.S. included owning property worth at least $1,000 or having a wife in the U.S. 
Both prerequisites reflected the class-based discrimination inherent within the Chinese Exclusion Act. Only a relatively wealthy Chinese immigrant would meet the requirements for return. Additionally, Congress refused state and federal courts the right to grant citizenship to Chinese resident aliens, although these courts could still deport them. Although Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, decades before the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, the act was a turning point in U.S. relations with Asian immigrants and their descendants. The act was significant for several reasons. First, by outlawing the immigration of laborers while in theory allowing the entry of merchants, students, teachers, diplomats, and travelers, the act established a precedent for the establishment of discriminatory race and class-based immigration laws in the U.S. Second, the act was an example of government-mandated racism. Finally, the act along with the 1878 ruling, Inri Ayup, denied naturalization rights to immigrant Chinese and served as the foundation for the racialization of Asian immigrants, including the Japanese, as unassimilable aliens. The Chinese Exclusion Act had a ripple effect on the United States' legal history. It was followed by the Geary Act of 1892, which extended the provisions of the Exclusion Act for another ten years. In 1902, the ban against the immigration of Chinese laborers was made permanent. By the end of 1888, the Scott Act made it impossible for Chinese travelers to return to the U.S. The Exclusion Act, along with the efforts of Chinese immigrants to resist poor treatment and pay by white employers, resulted in a loss of cheap labor in the continental U.S. and after the annexation of the Hawaiian Kingdom in Hawaii as well. As a result, Japan was targeted, in particular by sugar plantation owners in Hawaii, as the next best potential source of labor. As increasing numbers of Japanese arrived in the U.S., anti-Chinese sentiment was re-articulated as anti-Japanese racism by many of the same forces responsible for early anti-Chinese racism. Officials were quick to claim the Chinese and Japanese were racially inferior and unassimilable. They were thought to be too culturally different to become full-fledged members of American society. This racialization had immense consequences during World War II, because Issei and Nisei alike were depicted by the mass media as foreign and a threat, thus rationalizing the internment of all individuals of Japanese ancestry as an act of military necessity. These are my works cited. Thank you for listening.